Hello, and welcome to this, the second lecture in our course, Introduction to Field Methods, held at Bielefeld University. Because of the fact that we are online for this course, and that the Hanzu language currently has no grammar, I thought that having a recording of this class where I talk about what we know and what we do not know about the language would be useful as we progress. You'll notice that this is not the approach taken by many Introduction to Field Methods courses where classes are often discouraged from engaging with previously written materials in order to simulate working with an entirely unknown language. Today, however, I believe it is reasonable to assume that most, if not every language, has some existing resources, and that it is important to know as much about the target language as possible. In this way, we avoid unnecessary repetition of work and can focus on more advanced and targeted topics. To begin, my name is Andrew Harvey, and I have been seriously working with the Hanzu language since 2018. In a wider context, I am interested in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, of which Ihanzu is a part, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evinced through language contact and linguistic arts. In today's lecture, I will start by situating Ihanzu in its wider context, geographical, historical, social, etc. I will then provide a brief comment on the data I use here and how to access it. We will then move to the structures of the language itself, its sounds, phonology and tonology, its morphology, and some open parts of speech, including nouns, verbs, and adjectives, as well as its syntax and some closed parts of speech. We will then talk a bit about the resources on Ihanzu available to us and how to use them. I think it's important that before we engage with the language from a formal perspective, we first take a moment to look at its position within the larger community in which it is used. Starting with a brief note on history, I will talk about the relationships, both genetic and aerial, which obtain between Ihanzu and other languages. Following this, I will talk about language use, language attitudes, and finally, the language name. But first, for an idea of what Ihanzu looks like, sounds like, let's listen to a short recording of Ihanzu with Samueli Isia talking with John Kipimo about Ihanzu riddles as a literary and pedagogical genre. Kendele kwa adaka adaki humira lero kotakire kilalike ekali ema humo no vila riki aimenda palungui sasa nakire gorelo kilali neke uvila riki aido kire uzaki eh eh anta waiti uvila riki nima humo eh anta waiti aida kore ndugu eye ingui ingui enso kao aida takire iti Agoko Mana aida kole ya bridugo uyuti numu songo mama uyuti numu numu go goku lakini ndali anyamhala palumwe ali nyamhala palumwe leo kia dunia so eh angazia nyadali mu here care of google maps is a rough map of the current area in which ihanzu is most commonly spoken and in which most of the people who identify as ihanzu live we can see from the inset that it is spoken in the north central part of the East African country of Tanzania. Today, all of this area falls within the administrative district of Mkalama, which is itself within the larger administrative region of Singida, labeled here with a gray dot. The surrounding land is primarily flat, especially in communities like Mkalama and Ibaga, here given as blue circles. But 
Many Ihanzu communities, such as Kirumi, are located in the forested hills here at the center of this map. Mkalama is of particular relevance, perhaps, to this audience, in that it was once the site of a large fort built by occupying German colonial forces in order to control the population of what was then a remote and restive part of German East Africa. The remains of the fort at Mkalama are still intact and are now considered by locals an important part of their heritage. We can see some relatively recent video of the fort and of the surrounding town and countryside here. Nkinto is noteworthy in that it is the site of an early expedition by Oscar Bauman, which produced this image of an old Ihanzu man, as it was labeled, perhaps one of the earliest photographs of an Ihanzu person we have, an image which often makes me wonder about the way in which this man lived his life and, indeed, what the place was like at the end of the 1800s. A great deal has changed since the moment this photo was taken, the transfer of German East Africa to the British and the creation of the British colonial Tanganyika territory, the hard-won independence of Tanganyika and its union with Zanzibar to form the modern entity we know as Tanzania, and over 50 years of modernization, villagization, socialism, democracy, globalization, and neoliberalism. It's important to note that though remote, the Ihanzu-speaking community has been part of this change and that their culture and language has changed along with it. Indeed, our Ihanzu colleagues are our contemporaries and as all speech communities of the African continent, just as modern as you or I, but perhaps in different ways. I'd like now to talk about linguistic relationships, that is, the links that exist between Ihanzu and other languages, both through shared origin or through geographical proximity. So if we swap our visualization representing the Ihanzu-speaking community in the previous map as the single blue pin at the center of this map, and zooming out, we can see all of the, other of the other languages to which Ihanzu is closely genetically related. These range from Sukuma, here in the top right, one of the largest African languages spoken across northern and central Tanzania by no less than 8 million people, to Kimbu, here at the very bottom of the map, probably spoken today by less than 50,000 speakers. This group of languages is known in the literature as the Takama branch of Bantu languages, and in a simplified genetic tree adapted from Masele 2001, we can represent it like this. We can see that Ihanzu shares the closest genetic and also, in fact, geographical relationship with Nilamba, reflected here in its similarities with words inherited from the reconstructed predecessor language Proto-Bantu. The relationships which Ihanzu exhibits are not, however, simply those of shared lineage. The larger area in which Ihanzu is spoken, the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, has been witness to the movement of humans for a very long time indeed, and it is here, the only place on the African continent, in which all four of Greenberg's African language phyla are in contact and have been in contact for a long time. In addition to this, the Rift Valley area is home to peoples and cultures which see the world and inhabit their environment in very different ways, from a people who rely primarily on livestock, to farmers, to people who get much of their food from hunting wild animals and gathering wild fruits and tubers. Some societies are patrilineal, where inheritance and descent pass through the father's family, while some, such as the Ihanzu, are matrilineal, where inheritance and descent pass through the mother's side. These are only some of the ways in which the Rift Valley area is both rich and diverse. Here we have a map of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area with Ihanzu highlighted in red, and immediately we can see a large number of languages with which Ihanzu is in contact today or was in contact with in the past. There are Bantu languages of the Takam branch to which Ihanzu belongs, as well as other Bantu languages to which Ihanzu is not immediately related. Nilotic languages, including the Eastern Nilotic Maasai and the Southern Nilotic Datoga group of languages are also widespread throughout the area. 
as well as South Cushitic languages. Sandawe, possibly a distant relative of the Khoikwadi language family, is also present. And finally, the language isolate Hadza, with which Ihanzu has probably shared intense and long-lasting contact. No dedicated language survey has been conducted to determine the number of Ihanzu speakers, but the Languages of Tanzania project estimated that in 2009 there were 26,000 speakers of Ihanzu in total. Personal observation would seem to indicate that in many locations, especially those bordering on other speech communities, speakers are shifting either to those larger languages, such as Nilamba or Sukuma, but are also relying more heavily on Swahili, the national lingua franca. Though most speakers don't seem ashamed of speaking Ihanzu, the use of Ihanzu is not really considered a serious question and is often framed in terms of it being an emblem of the old way, as opposed to larger languages such as Nilamba, with which they can do business with a larger number of people, or Swahili, with which they can adopt more contemporary national identities. Ihanzu is often called Isanzu, and in fact, all of the highest profile sources for language data use this form. The form Ki Sanzu or Kini Sanzu is also seen, which is simply the Swahili form of this word. Ihanzu is an English adaptation of how the Ihanzu people refer to their language, which in Ihanzu is called Kit Nihanzu, broken down here into the noun class prefix, a partly lexicalized morpheme, and the language name. It is this English form we will use to refer to the language. Ihanzu can also be described using these unique identifiers, the ISO 639-3 code ISN, the GLOTO code, or the geographically based Guthrie code, which is used by Bantuists. As an introductory note on data, this talk itself will be archived with the following DOI and will also be available on my YouTube account, which can be accessed by following the QR code on the screen. All the data in this talk comes from my own field work with Ihanzu, and most examples of phrasal length or longer will be provided along with a unique identifying number designed to allow quick access to the specific recording in which the utterance takes place. This identifier is composed of two parts, an alphanumeric code to the left of the full stop and a number to the right of a full stop. The alphanumeric code to the left of the full stop corresponds to the file name of the bundle which is the primary unit of organization in the Hanzu audiovisual archive and can be accessed by entering it into the search bar within the deposit. The number to the right of the full stop corresponds to the utterance number within the recording. This can be found by looking at the accompanying ALON file and looking in the phrase segment number tier, or by referring to the numbered utterance in the PDF file. In this case, the highlighted utterance in this PDF file would have, would have the following unique identifier. To start looking at Ihanzu from a formal perspective, we'll start with the sounds of the language. I have the most to say about this module of the language, mainly because I've had to think the most about the sounds of Ihanzu to begin learning about the rest. We'll begin with phonology and then examine tone, followed by some examples of how these two elements interact with the language's morphology. First, Ihanzu is a seven vowel system with two semivowels. To make writing a bit easy, easier, I write the central vowels in the following way. Perhaps our first question is that of vowel length. In other accounts of Ihanzu, which to be fair are cursory and indirect, it is noted or implied that the language has both long and short versions of all vowels. Whether that means they must be established as phonemes in Ihanzu is another matter. It is clear that there are certainly sequences of vowels which are both phonetically longer than others and which make words contrastive. For example, compare the, for, the form ukokua, he is hitting you, and ukokua, you are hitting it. Clearly, vowel length is an important factor here. But upon closer examination, it seems all occurrences of long vowels can either be described as combinations of two different morphemes or phonetically long vowels occurring in predictable environments. Take, for example, the phrase 
muhumba no li, which boy. The long o vowel is a combination of two short u morphemes, which surface as one long vowel. Similarly, in the phrase ko ga uele, we are winnowing bulrush millet with a seemingly extra long vowel, the o vowel is actually the combination of three separate morphemes. Similarly, vowels that seem long appear to have been lengthened by predictable phonetic operations. Take the e vowel of mutele, liar. The vowel is probably short underlyingly, but has been lengthened before the consonant l. Now, whether there is more to this rule or not, especially in terms of whether this can be any l or not, is an open question. Similarly, the form kupamba to decorate is written in Masele's 2001 word list with a long vowel, but this seems to be the product of a predictable phonetic process in which a vowel is lengthened before a prenasalized consonant. To conclude on the question of whether a set of phonemic long vowels should be proposed for Ihanzu, if yes, I would want to see a convincing lexical minimal pair, and if no, I would like to see a comprehensive list of predictable phonetic lengthening rules. The consonant inventory of Ihanzu is as given here, and has a rich series of plosives and nasals, and a rather more parsimonious collection of other sounds. The voiced alveolar fricative Z is a rare allophone of the voiced alveolar affricate, and the tap is a regular allophone of the alveolar lateral approximant L. There is also a rich array of prenasalized stops, which is a hallmark of many Bantu languages. One notable gap is that there are no labiodental fricatives in Ihanzu. This is salient in that all other Takama branch Bantu languages do have at least one labiodental, and often two. Except for Ihanzu and its close genetic and aerial neighbor, Nyilamba. Maselli 2001 makes a pretty convincing argument that, just like the reconstructed Proto-Bantu lacked fricatives, so too did the theorized predecessor language of the current Takama languages, that is, Proto-Takama. The argument is then advanced that each of the Takama languages developed fricatives in their own way. As such, Sukuma developed the following set, and Yaturu developed this set. Note, however, how both of these are considerably more extensive than the set of three fricatives in Ihanzu. In fact, more insight may come from looking at a language from outside the Takama branch and actually fully outside of Bantu. As mentioned above, Ihanzu is in contact with the language isolate Hadza. And if we compare Ihanzu's set of fricatives with Hadza's set of fricatives, and especially if we consider F as a marginal or recently borrowed sound in Hadza, as it indeed appears to be, we can see that the two inventories are highly similar. One way to see this as is that when Ihanzu speakers arrived in the area which they currently inhabit, a large number of Hadza-speaking people were incorporated into Ihanzu society. As such, sound changes which resulted in other Takama languages like Sukuma and Yaturu developing fricatives were blocked because the Hadza-speaking people learning Ihanzu or speaking Ihanzu as a second language did not have these sounds either. With that said, Masali 2001 argues that Ihanzu underwent none of the sound changes which the other Takama branch languages underwent. If this is the case, we must posit the phonemes S, SH, and H as present in Proto-Takama. If this is not the case, then we must propose an appropriate scenario for the development of these sounds in contemporary Ihanzu. Three such possible scenarios are given here, but again, remain to be fully investigated. Moving from phonology to tonology, we will now examine each of the following tonal properties in Ihanzu. First, the system is composed of two tonal values, high and low, though because low tones don't figure in any of the tonal rules, we can actually propose that underlyingly Ihanzu has one tone, high, and that low is zero. As such, we then have minimal pairs such as Kokonga to prepare greens with low tone throughout, and Kokonga to deceive with a word final high tone. There are also tonal, tonal minimal pairs for nouns as well, such as Ntundu. gallbladder with low tone throughout, and Ntundu. 
with high tone on the initial syllable. In addition to distinguishing several lexical minimal pairs, tone plays an extensive role in grammatical marking, and grammatical tonal minimal pairs exist for every verb. For example, we have oe okosia. You are grinding and wenso okosia. He or she is grinding. In addition to high and low tone, other surface realizations are possible. So for example, words ending in a high tone when phrase internal are realized as high, as in this example. Nwenda otamukire. The clothing is torn. However, when words ending in a high tone are phrase final, that sound, that high tone is realized as falling, as in Nene kutuma nwenda. I am sewing clothing. High tones in Ihanzu may also be realized as downdrifted high. That is, following the first high tone of a phrase, all following high tones are realized as slightly lower. As such, all of the following high tones in a phrase like this one above would be realized as progressively lower than the previous high tone, but still would be interpreted as high. Note, however, that in an example like the one here, the second tone would be realized as just as high as the first high tone. This is because the second high tone exists inside of a relative clause and downdrift seems to be reset by relative clause. That is to say, tonal phenomena interact with syntactic structure in a real and measurable way. Note that of the realizations given here, high and low tone are phonemic. That is, they are discrete, meaningful differences manipulated by Hanzu speakers in order to differentiate meaning. Meanwhile, falling tone and downdrifted high tones are phonemic. That is, they are variations of high tone, and though pronounced somewhat differently, are understood by Ihanzu speakers as high tones. As such, when writing Ihanzu, we do not need to write falling and downdrifted high differently than high tone. Their well-defined contexts will signal when they must be produced as such. The tone-bearing unit in Ihanzu is the syllable. This can be surmised from the fact that high tone can never manifest on moraic consonants such as prenasalized consonants, but must manifest on vowels, such as in the example above, where a form like kukonga never occurs in Ihanzu, and as far as I know, is structurally impossible. And kukonga, to deceive, is a common sort of structure in the language. The sounds of Ihanzu interact with each other in some notable ways. Sometimes these operations are restricted to certain morphemes, and other times they are more global. We'll talk about a few of the more salient ones here. First, in a common operation in many Bantu languages, is homorganic nasal assimilation. This occurs when the class 9 or 10 noun prefixes affix to a noun stem. The prefix will then become a nasal consonant with the same place of articulation as the consonant which follows it. Thus, if the class 9 morpheme affixes to the stem bogulu, we get mbogulu bag. Whereas if the same class 9 prefix affixes to the stem dogwe, we get ndogwe, donkey. Further, if an L follows a nasal, it will be realized as a D. This is referred to as postnasal fortition. Thus, the stem lipu for long is realized as lolipu when preceded by a vowel u. It is realized as ndipu when preceded by a nasal. The morpheme mu becomes palatalized when followed by a vowel which is not back. As such, where the morpheme, where the morpheme mu attaches to the stem eli for moon or month, we get mweli. Another instance of this is the form wana, child. Commonly, certain consonants in Ihanzu will lenite to H when they occur between vowels. The verb muhukoloma underlyingly contains a K, but when pronounced, this is often realized as H. Interestingly, this seems to operate on a diachronic level as well. Here we can see two cognates in Ihanzu and Yulamba, with the highlighted consonants lenited in Ihanzu. This actually includes the name of the language itself. The operation is not entirely well defined, however. Here we can see that the underlying K does not simply lenite, but it is completely elided. This also seems to occur diachronically as well in the cognates for cough shown below. As such, the rule probably needs to be further specified. 
and more investigation needs to be done perhaps to differentiate historical processes from contemporary ongoing ones. Similar to how segments can interact with each other and with morphology in specific ways, so too can supersegmental elements, that is, tones. Tonal shift is straightforward and describes a process where a tone will move rightward from one syllable to the next. This seems to be a property of the individual morpheme, that is, a given morpheme, if it has high tone, will either have high tone that must shift or high tone which must not shift. I indicate such tones which must, must shift as offset from the vowel in the second line of the interlinearization as the form highlighted above. As another example, we can see that the lexical stem for the form send also has a shifting tone. This is then realized on the final vowel of the verb. Mewusun's rule operates to eliminate adjacent high tones such that of a series of immediately adjacent high tones, Mewusun's rule deletes all but the first. This is why, for example, the object marker mo in the first example has a low tone and the second has a high tone. In the first example, the shifting high tone from the second person singular subject marker manifests directly before and immediately adjacent to the high tone of the object marker. As such, the high tone of the object marker is deleted. Because the third person singular subject marker of the second example does not have a shifting high tone, the high tone of the object marker remains high. Note, however, that even within what we are referring to as single words and are written as single words, Mewson's rule does not always apply. As such, there are syntactic considerations to take into account in defining the domain over which Mewson's rule obtains, which have yet to be fully determined. And again, this is a question for further analysis. Moving now to morphology and the open parts of speech, we will in turn look at the noun, followed by the verb, followed by the adjective. Here's a simple phrase in Ihanzu, umuhumba okumeko ampichi, the boy is hitting the hyena. Glossed and interlinearized, it looks like this. The phrase has a subject noun, umuhumba, the boy, and an object noun, impichi, the hyena. Ihanzu is primarily a head-marking language, so if we were to create a new phrase in which the hyena is the subject of the verb to hit and the boy is the object of the verb to hit, there would be no formal change in the morphological form of the noun, as we can see in a comparison of the highlighted forms here. But rather, the agreement on the verb would change. You'll also notice that the position of the arguments would typically change. But where agreement explicitly differentiates the arguments, as in this case, the change of position is not obligatory. Returning now to the nouns at hand, when we, current, when we provide the inter, interlinearization as I currently understand it, we can see that both nouns in this case are composed of three separate morphemes. This includes the stem, which contains some but not all of the lexical identity of the noun, as well as two other morphemes. We'll start our analysis from the morpheme closest to the stem, the class marker. And class is a system of nominal categorization used by the Bantu languages and is somewhat similar to, though distinct from, gender. Here we can see that the noun meaning young man and the noun meaning hyena are members of two different noun classes in that they take two distinct noun class prefixes. In all, and according to the traditional Bantuist numbering system, Ihanzu has 17 noun classes, the classes and the corresponding noun class prefixes given here in our table. We'll begin our description with these highlighted classes, which are in many ways the more canonical of the noun classes. We'll then discuss the others. The first thing to note is that most of these noun classes can be arranged in singular plural pairs. That is, the odd number noun classes represent singular entities and the even number noun classes represent plural entities. And as such, in our example here, the class 1 noun, montu, means person, and the class 2 noun, antu, means people. The same applies for the examples given for classes 3, 4, 7, 8, and 9, 10. Classes 11, 12, and 13 do not behave in this way. The noun class prefix ka, for example, is used to prefix to a noun which already has a class marker, and gives that noun a diminutive meaning. 
We can see here that kamongo is the diminutive of class 3 noun mongo, a river. But in fact, using class 12 to diminutivize nouns in Ihanzu is relatively rare and may have been a recent introduction for, from other Bantu languages in the area. Much more common is the use of the prefix ngwa. So rather than kamongo, much more common is the form ngwamongo. Note that etymologically the prefix ngwa is related to the noun ngwana, child. Class 14 has no plural form, so for example in Ihanzu, if we, wish, if we wish to say bows, we would simply use the form ota and let the context express the number value. Additionally, many nouns put in class 14 are abstract nouns and often cannot pluralize. Note that the noun class prefixes for classes 9 and 10 are formally identical, and therefore it is wider agreement which will differentiate the nouns of these two groups for number value. Uh, this includes classes such as adjectives, which we will see shortly. Note also that the noun class adds, also adds lexical information. The stem for the nouns of both classes 1, and 1, 2, and 7, 8 is actually the same, but when given a class 1, 2 prefix, it means person, and when given a class 7, 8 prefix, it means thing. In fact, many nouns for persons are of class 1, 2, and many nouns for inanimates are of class 7, 8. As such, we might want to think of the stem as meaning something like entity and the class prefixes telling us everything else. Returning to the table, we can now look at classes 15 through 18, which are often called noun classes for their formal and distributional similarities with the other noun class prefixes, but are in many important ways different. First, classes 16, 17, and 18 are once again prefixes which attach to nouns already valued for noun class and add a locational meaning to that noun. So as such, the word pamongo means at the river. The class 15 prefix attaches to stems that are often considered verbal and results in a verb with an infinitival or maybe even nominal meaning. Returning now to our example nouns, we will now examine the most external prefixes, the augments. The augments all show agreement with the noun class of the noun to which they attach, and the forms are given here. All are vowels, and many are homophonous. Here we can see the somewhat special status of classes 15 to 18, as well as the rather marginal status of class 12, in that thus far these forms have not been recorded with an augment. As for what role the augment plays, I still can't really tell for sure. Ihanzu speakers have told me that it fills the same role as the definite article the in English, but I've elicited examples in which I would think the definite article would be obligatory, but the equivalent in Ihanzu can occur either with or without the augment. This tells me the augment may be playing more complex, perhaps pragmatic roles, and the data that we need is natural texts rather than phrase-length elicitation. So are Ihanzu augments markers of definiteness, or are they something else? This is another puzzle and needs further research. As with many Bantu verbs, the verb in Ihanzu hosts a rich array of morphology, which we will now examine in overview. Returning once again to our simple example and focusing on the verb, we can see that this particular verb form can be broken down into five separate morphemes. This includes the stem, which contains some but not all of the lexical identity of the verb, as well as four other morphemes. We'll start from the leftmost of these morphemes, the subject marking prefix. Once again, the verbal subject marking prefix agrees with the subject noun in noun class, and the different forms are given here. Thus far, we have ignored the speech act participants, but we will introduce them here. They do not have overt noun class prefixes, the bracketed forms are the full pronouns that you would use, but they do take augments and verbal subject marking prefixes. Once again, we can see the rather marginal status of classes 12, as well as the different status of classes 15, 16, 17, and 18, in that thus far, these forms have not been recorded with a subject marking prefix. Classes 1 to 14 are given here with an example and a translation. And here, the Speech Act participant classes, first and second persons, are given. Note that the first person singular form has two distinct subject marking prefixes, and this is because the second variant is used from verbs in the subjunctive mood, and the first is used everywhere else. 
Whether other classes also have special subjunctive forms will require some further examination. Moving from the subject marking prefix, we will now examine the second morpheme here, which is a marker of tense aspect. So far, I've identified four tense aspect markers in Ihanzu, not all of which attach at the same part of the verb. So these two attach at the location shown in the example above, i.e. between the subject marking prefix and the object marking prefix, which we'll see in a second. These two attach between the verb stem and the final vowel. Note that for these highlighted forms, the verb form do not have the same tonal characteristics as the other forms and seem to behave differently from how I've described tone above. I expect this to be a case of the tense aspect uh, markers imposing a special tonal rule to the verb as a word, but again, this will require further examination. Returning now to our familiar example, the third morpheme here is an object marker. In this case, the me morpheme is agreeing with the noun class of the object, the hyena, which is noun class nine. Again, all object markers agree in noun class with their object. And the markers for classes 1 to 14 are shown here with an example. And here are examples for the Speech Act participants. I'm still uncertain as to the tonal status of some of these object markers. And actually, now that all of these forms have been given, I also do not know whether any sort of vowel height harmony operates within the verb or within parts of the verb. That is, are the verbs, are the vowels fixed in value or can they undergo changes according to the quality of nearby vowels? This is also a puzzle which needs to be examined. Returning now to our well-worn example, the final vowel is just that, a final vowel. This form seems to play a role in well-formedness, but also is sensitive to mood distinctions. So, realis forms take a final vowel, ah, and irrealis, namely the subjunctive and the imperative, take a final vowel, a. In fact, this is a relatively simple verb form uh, when we look at it in total, and verbs in Ihanzu can express considerably more morphologically, and I'd like to talk about that now. Uh, represented as morphemes within a template, the current example that we've used uh, would look like this. By changing the tense aspect to perfect, the template looks like this, with the first tense aspect place vacant, but the second filled. Ihanzu also has a further position for tense morphemes before the subject marking. Many of these tense aspect morphemes can combine to express precise combinations. The very first morpheme is one introducing a relative clause or expressing subordination, as in this example. Negation occupies a space between the relative marker and the space two for tense aspect morphemes. In addition to tense, aspect, clause type, and negation, Ihanzu also has a series of verbal extensions which attach directly after the verb stem. These often serve to modify the valency of the verb. This example, which uses an applicative suffix, adds a further, often benefactive, argument to the phrase. So in this case, it is now the hyena being hit for the new argument's sake, for the boy's benefit. Note that the object marker now mar makes agreement with the benefactive argument, the boy, rather than the direct object, uh, the hyena. The tone, range of meanings, uh, this form can occur in lexicalized forms as well, and syntax of the various verbal extensions in Ihanzu still need further investigation. The passive morpheme is marked between the extensions and the final vowel and makes the semantic theme or patient the grammatical subject. Note that the subject agreement here is with the hyena, the semantic patient, and the semantic agent has become an oblique argument, which is unmarked on the verb. From a morphological perspective, if the passive morpheme and the perfect morpheme occur together, the result is that these two morphemes become fused together as the form ilwe. This is a common phenomenon in many Bantu languages, especially for these two morphemes, and is known as imbrication. Adjectives, like the form highlighted here, also agree for the noun class of their head noun. Adjectival agreement for noun class is indicated here. Adjectives can be used attributively, as in the first example, as well as predicatively, as in the second example. Note that the copula in this case is phonetically null, with a high tone which moves to the beginning of the adjective itself. In this part of the talk, 
We've introduced some of the morphological patterns of the language, as well as some of the open parts of speech. However, two other entire classes remained unmentioned, that is, the class of adverb and the class of idiophone. This is mainly because more research is required to better understand and to describe these forms. So now I'll begin the next session on syntax and some closed parts of speech with a disclaimer. Because my understanding of Ihanzu is still developing, and this is the module of language about which I understand the least. With that said, this should provide some basis, and I hope that during this course we can proceed from here. To begin, within the noun phrase, adjectives follow their head nouns. This gives us forms like mohomba, moripu, a tall boy, but means uh, that the inverse ordering is ungrammatical. If we want to add an additional noun to the noun phrase, a connective particle is used. And as many other parts of speech, the connective agrees with its head noun for noun class. So the agreement can be seen here. Returning to our stock example to examine the clause, the most common word order is subject, verb, object. But again, as we've seen before, other uh, orderings are possible if uh, the subject and object are clearly differentiated uh, by marking on the noun, or on the verb, I should say. Though beyond this, most of Ihansu's syntax still remains to be explicitly presented and described, which I hope serves as encouragement for those of us taking this class. Finally, I would like to mention some of the principal resources we will be working with during the course of our study. Though still largely undescribed, a number of resources about the Ihanzu language are in development and will help us develop effective questions and move our understanding forward. The other two resources are people-based, which we'll also take a moment to discuss. The first resource is Harvey 2019, the Endangered Languages Archive Deposit of Ihanzu, which I've been building for the past couple of years. Eventually, all materials I have recorded or created as part of this project will be openly accessible here. At present, all of my work up to and including 2018 is accessible here and available for anyone to use. This includes images of written resources, such as all of my raw field notes, but also all corresponding audio and video files as well. And if these aren't usable directly on the site, uh, they may be downloaded and used from your computer. Any XML files archived here refer to ALON audiovisual annotation files. These are relatively rich timeline translations and transcriptions from virtually all elicitation I did during 2018 and are accompanied by glosses consistent with my best understanding of the language up until late 2019. Obviously, this is not perfect, but it will be a useful start. PDF files are usually uh, text exports of transcriptions and translations, where the numbering corresponds exactly to the ALON files. Again, glosses reflect my understanding as of 2019, but these should be useful as a start. The FLEX database contains all of the material I have translated and transcribed, uh, and is openly accessible and downloadable from this uh, file in the Hanzu archive. This means that if you already have FLEX on your machine, you can download this file and have my workspace on your computer as well. The benefits of FLEX is that it makes searching for constructions, morphemes, and lexical items, as well as examples, relatively easy, but it only works on Windows and Linux machines, so if you're working with a Mac, there are no easy workarounds, unfortunately. And of course, no matter what operating system you run, Nico will be fully functional. Nicolas Nalingigwa Gideon will be our primary Ihanzu consultant during this course, and has been one of my primary consultants during my work. Not only is he an incredibly patient, precise, and cheerful language consultant, he speaks very fluent English and will therefore be able to work with all of us. This is not the case for many other speakers of Ihanzu, so we are very lucky to be learning with him, and I know he's very excited to meet you all. And of course, we will have each other. Data collected by one individual will be available to all of us, and we should get used to sharing analyses, asking each other questions, and generally helping each other through what I hope will be an intense, stimulating, and fruitful period of data collection. Field linguistics can be conducted in many ways and in many different contexts, with different languages, different questions, and different tools. But I'd like to think that the one unifying characteristic is that it requires reflexivity, the ability to examine one's work and one's approaches critically, with the constant question of how can I do this better. It is my hope that we, as a group, can be reflexive, and that we can constantly improve 
both our understanding of Ihansu, but also our practice as field linguists. Thank you, and here are the references. <laughs>